Hello, Asley. My name is Ashley Rice. Thank you for attending our panel today. I'm especially grateful to my fellow panelists for including me despite my last minute absence. I wish I could be there with you in person. My presentation is titled Tourism's Promotional Landscapes, Settler Erasure and Essentialism in Gateway National Park Communities. I'm coming to you today from the site of interest I will discuss today, so-called Jackson, Wyoming, which is located outside of Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks. Located on the unceded homelands of the Northern Arapaho, Eastern Shoshone, Shoshone Bannock, and Cheyenne peoples, along with numerous other tribes, nations, and confederacies, Jackson, Wyoming is what is known as a gateway community. It offers access to national parks like Grand Teton and Yellowstone. The town of Jackson and Jackson Hole, or Teton Valley, is fraught territory. Gateway communities like this one face many challenges from balancing the need for tourism revenue with conservation efforts, safeguarding wildlife in the face of necessary development, and generating affordable housing for the local workforce that keeps these communities running, while billionaires purchase second and third homes, inflating real estate values across the valley. Today, I'll discuss another complex and multifaceted eco, social, economic, and equity-based issue at play in such communities. This issue is on prominent display for tourists and visitors surveying many of Jackson's town square storefronts. One step across these thresholds yields access to what they deem authentic Native American arts and crafts, and through these wares to a Western America that settler nostalgia longs to produce. And these stores are the texts on which I will focus my talk today. I'll discuss three stores in particular, Two Gray Hills Native American Arts and Jewelry, Native Jackson Hole, and Boyer's Indian Arts and Crafts. When I visited these stores, I wondered, what settler narrative is the minimized local presence of indigenous arts and crafts offered by settlers in our colonial systems, systems like tourism with its roots in capitalism and appropriation, imposing on these lands and their first peoples, and in turn on visitors to the area? Indeed, white settler marketing of indigenous arts and culture through the sale of ceramics, rugs, and jewelry perpetuates the erasure of contemporary indigenous populations and their historical presence in contemporary ties to gateway communities like Jackson. Accordingly, these stores perpetuate contemporary colonization. But in gateway communities like Jackson, accessible to nearby reservations such as the Wind River Reservation, where talented Northern Arapaho and Eastern Shoshone artists of various mediums reside, solutions to this issue abound, and I will outline these as well. Embracing these solutions would allow gateway communities like Jackson to position themselves at the forefront of anti-colonial efforts by providing a model for anti-colonial tourism that codes indigenous peoples not as a, quote, dying breed, end quote, found only at, quote, the peripheries of modernity, end quote, but as stakeholders and agents in efforts to revitalize their local presence through artistic visibility. I visited each store as a tourist might, allowing retail sales associates to approach me, chatting with them only if they first engaged me in order to most accurately glean what information a typical visitor to the area might. My first visit was to Two Gray Hills Native American Indian Arts and Jewelry, where I encountered store owner Gary Mathais, who was busy chatting with customers. While Gary explained to a tourist from Minnesota that he no longer carried grizzly bear claws because he'd gotten a lot of what he called feedback as a result, I was afforded time to evaluate the narrative his store establishes regarding the indigenous presence in Jackson Hole. A visitor to this store would likely surmise from the display of smooth Pueblo pottery patterned Navajo or Diné rugs and, po and polished Hopi jewelry that these tribes and nations have ties to the lands of Northwest Wyoming. Tags and cards attached to these pieces tell the story of their tribal origins and direct shoppers to books available for purchase where they can learn more about the peoples indigenous to the lands hundreds of miles to our South. Gary has relationships with Pueblo makers in New Mexico from whom he purchases goods 
ranging from pottery to rugs to jewelry. He sells them here at an upcharge. Just a few blocks to the west, directly off the square, I next visited Boyer's Indian Arts and Crafts. Boyer's is guilty of reducing indigeneity to a singular notion, as they offer a majority Navajo made works, which they label, quote, genuine Indian American handmade and genuine Native American handmade, end quote, in a move that flattens indigenous culture. If they featured indigenous folks at all, it was in generic, severely dated looking photos of indigenous people upholding a dangerous stereotype that indigeneity is a thing of the past, often without listed tribal affiliation or identification. Although, as you can see in the photo that I've provided, there is luckily at least affiliation listed here. At Boyer's, I overheard a shopper, a white presenting woman, likely settler in origin, note of a belt buckle made of buffalo nickel she had her eye on. This reminds me of my grandfather. Her reaction, as I understood it, speaks to the kind of settler nostalgia that perpetuates colonialism today. That is, white settlers have a history of taking from indigenous peoples. We put their visage on coins we trade through a system of capitalism and give them little in return for one, but we also wear their traditional regalia and jewelry without crediting them or paying those who've made it, and we pass on the desire to do so to our descendants. Finally, I headed next door to Native Jackson Hole. This store boasted a variety of jewelry and goods made by makers from a wide array of tribes and nations. I saw a placard in indicating goods had been made by Diné, Chippewa, and Pueblo artists, as well as Blackfoot ledger art. It was here that I saw the closest thing to a piece made by a locally affiliated artist. For sale was a turtle shell rattle a maker of Cheyenne Heritage had crafted. However, this store seemingly has a partnership with artist Calvin Begay, who is a Navajo designer, and thus he's not local. His name and portrait are featured prominently in the store, steps from a headdress or war bonnet, likely pilfered from a Plains tribe rather than a local one. While the store has signs posted on the headdress and throughout telling visitors not to photograph the headdress, I am not one to follow such rules and you can see the headdress in the photograph provided. I'll also let you consider the implications of such signage and the desire to keep you know, visitors like myself from photographing. Each store on its own, and these stores holistically, codes the Northwest Wyoming indigenous experience as both a homogenized one rooted in a broad settler imaginary of an indigenous American West, one that is too often relegated to the past. This means settlers are perpetuating indigenous erasure on indigenous homelands when we should be educating visitors about local tribes' historical presence in and contemporary ties to the community and the parklands. This despite the reality that the local Wind River Reservation is home to thriving local artistic presence. These stores have the potential to leave uninformed visitors and customers with the following conceptions of indigeneity. First, that all indigenous cultures equate to something similar, that of Navajo, Hopi, or Pueblo peoples. Secondly, that indigenous peoples are a thing of the past rather than living, thriving individuals who make and sell art or profess at universities or recreate on stolen public lands. You get the idea. And thirdly, that indigenous culture is an essentialized one, that there even is such a thing as Native American made earrings or a necklace rather than art made by individuals who represent one or multiple of the 574 federally recognized tribes, nations, and confederacies in the US, not to mention those 200 plus not federally recognized. Since I first visited these sites in the summer of 2022, I've witnessed an exciting development. Jackson Center for the Arts is currently hosting Grounded, Restoring Our World Through a Sacred Harmony with the Earth and Each Other, an art exhibit in the words of the Center for the Arts, featuring 15 premier and emerging contemporary artists from indigenous American tribes. This includes local artists like Robert Martinez, who is Northern Arapaho and lives on the Wind River Reservation. This is a great first step, and I hope it's only, it's, it's a jumping off point. 
Gateway communities should also be subsidizing storefront space for indigenous artists, however. We could be bringing in creators and cultural leaders from nearby reservations and communities and establ establishing networks of indigenous visibility within these critical cultural and environmental communities. In the meantime, visitors and shoppers should at least be asking retail workers who makes the goods the store sells, if they're local to the area, and if they aren't, why the store doesn't host local makers. They should also ask how makers are being compensated. Certainly, there is more room to be done in terms of decolonizing gateway communities, but the arts and maker space provides ample opportunity for this work, as does the space of gateway communities like Jackson, Wyoming. Thank you very much and have a great conference.